Good morning and welcome. Um, today we'll be doing uh, our Super Self Seminar, which deals with thought empowerment. And what we'll look at is how basically you as an individual are going to win back that power that at some place, somewhere, you gave away to somebody else without perhaps necessarily knowing that you gave it away. We're also going to look at techniques for creating a consciousness inside of you that's really powerful, that hones down, so that instead of you going into the physical plane and struggling with it and pushing for it and, and you know, sort of grabbing and, and, and hiring and working hard, that you can begin to move through the physical plane very, very fluidly. So you move into one place, everything shows up for you on time, then you move to another place, it shows up for you on time, and everything just flows naturally as it would in nature. If you look at the animals in the forest, they don't struggle. They don't, they don't go, ah, I've got to try hard today. You know, the tiger doesn't get up in the morning and go, ah, I'm going to do my affirmations, I'm going to do my... <laughs> I'm going to stick the alfalfa sprouts up my nose. I'm going to jog around the block. I'm going to take my vitamins, and I'm going to go out there and really zuck them in the forest today. In fact, the tiger just gets up. It sniffs some the, under its little tiger armpits, and maybe it blows a little tiger wind or whatever it does, and it heads out. And it doesn't worry about eating. It doesn't worry about survival. It just goes through the forest naturally. Then around about lunchtime, there's this little deer on the path and it has to run after the deer and get it, you know? And some of you are gonna find that in life, you know? There's a point where you're gonna have to like cross over, you know, cross town or something like that, go pick up the check, but it's not a problem, you know? There's a little bit of work involved in being in the physical plane because we're in our physical bodies, but life is supposed to be fluid, it's supposed to be gay, and what we're doing here basically as humans is we're picking up experiences. We're picking up experiences and picking up like the facts of life. We're not here to obey a whole bunch of, of, of rules and regulations that may have been laid down thousands of years ago when conditions were different. We're here basically as humans to come into our own empowerment, and that empowerment is what I call the life force, and that life force is love. And so you get to the point in your life where you just radiate absolute love for all things. And love, in my, in my term, and I will talk about it later on some more, is not this kind of gooey, mushy, I love you stuff, you know, which is sort of always seems to me like, like a sort of a wet lick in the air. It's more like, <laughs> it's more like a compassion for society, a compassion for the trials of mankind, a compassion for yourself, you know, where you're prepared to forgive yourself for any weaknesses or any parts of your life that are a little less than perfect. And so I think that like love in its highest expression is an ability to look at the world from an overview, be somewhat detached from it, and feel a compassion for it, and feel and understand that the people are all doing the very, very best they can, you know? They're doing their best given whatever circumstances they find themselves in. And when you get to that position in your life and you can move through the physical plane fluidly, you have got the compassion, you have got this emotional detachment from society, then all of a sudden you begin to become free. And the whole object of the whole human experience is for you to win back your power, to win back your freedom. The societies we live in are totally designed to control you and to control me and to control all of us. You know, the institutions deal with control. All the financial systems are systems that deal with keeping the common man uninformed, unempowered, and supporting the system. Each one of you goes out each day and you support the country, you support the military, you support the institutions, you support the families, the neighborhoods, you run the bus systems, you run the trains, you give birth to the citizens, you nurture them, you feed them, you, you, know, you wipe their, you, you change their diapers and stuff, and it's always the common man that is asked to pay the bill. It's always the common man and, and, and the common and, and the female, you know, the working woman who's asked to basically pay the bill for the entire thing. And if anything goes wrong or anything gets, mis you know, any kind of mistake is made or there's some kind of problem, they send you a love letter. It's called taxes. And they just crank up your taxes. They say, okay, we made this incredible mistake and we bought all these missiles and nobody figured out how to fire them. And it's only going to cost a billion dollars, but we're sending you the bill. Here, I take the bill. Please send us the cash Friday. And if you don't send the cash, they lock you up or they harry you or they jump on your case in some way. And so you have to pay. And as I look at that, I think, well, now, who stands for us? Who stands for the common man? Who stands for this individual heroically moving towards this quintessence within herself or within himself? Who stands for our rights? Who stands for, for our quest in life? And who wins back our power force? And if you look at society and you look at the history of the world, and I've always been very, very interested in the sort of historical perspective of how energy and peoples and philosophies has developed. If you look at the history of the world, nobody ever stands for us. 
You know, none of the societies are ever designed for the people. And the world isn't designed for the people. You only have to get into like an average bath in, in an average hotel and you can see it's not designed for the people because the faucets are kind of these squiggly little things that you can't work with your feet. And you've either got to sit up at the end where the faucets are and burn your back or you have to get up out of the bath to change how much water's in there. And as you look at those faucets, you think they never thought this out for human beings. I mean, faucets are supposed to be worked with your feet, you know? And if there was a little handle with a little place for you to put your toe and you could work the faucets with your feet, you'd say, this world is designed for me. But of course it isn't. You get in an airline seat and the airline seat doesn't have enough room for a passenger to actually sit in it. You know, and when the guy in front leans back on you, you know, you have even less room. And so you go all the way to Taiwan or whatever it is, 17 hours, looking at this piece of fabric on your nose. <laughs> and, and then you can say to yourself, is this world designed for me? It isn't. It's designed for the airline. If you ever think that the passengers are anything to do with an airline, you're totally luli luli because <laughs> They, the passengers have nothing to do with it. You know, they just shoo shoo us all on. And I do a lot of traveling as I go around the planet. And you watch people in airports. I mean, it's like they're like automatons. They're sort of Kansas City, Oklahoma. And they're all scared out their brains. And the thing's uncomfortable. And they give you plastic food. In fact, I think the most dangerous thing about flying is eating the food. Because, you know, that stuff is sort of sterilized. I think they mine it someplace. And <laughs> it comes up. And there's a corporation that has like the franchise for mining this plastic. And the food grows out of the plastic, I think. I've got a feeling it does. But when you look at that, you know, you look at, I mean, the whole of the world is like that. And of course, we take it so much for granted. We take the uncomfortableness for granted. We take the difficulties for granted because they trained us to not complain, you know? Like if you complain, you're not a good citizen, you know, like somehow you're going against, I don't know, the word of God or something. If you happen to say, look, this stuff's total garbage. I don't want to eat it. Anyway, as you look at that, you can rant and you can rave and you can say, wait a minute, you know, this isn't built for me, this isn't the society for me, what am I going to do about it? I want to change the society. The fact is that you can't change the society by going to it and pushing against them and saying, we want you to change, you know, we want a revolution, because all of that really sucks you right back into that same kind of energy that the society is built from. And when you look at the revolutions throughout history, what came after the revolution was usually at least as bad as what was going on before you know, if not worse. So you replace, let's say, the oppressive Tsarist regime in Russia, the, the regime of the Romanovs, and you, you created, you know, the society for the people, the communist society, and it's, it's equally restrictive, equally repressive. And as you look at the history of the world, the revolutions never really change very much. And so as we look at that, and as we look at that as questing conscious individuals, we can say, OK, are we prepared to change society by fighting against it? Or do we do a, a, a sort of a withdrawal program on it and basically pull out somewhat, build our power, and then return back to the society, return back to the planet, and heal it? And that's personally how I think it's going to have to be done. Because we're looking at a world today that really needs healing. It needs a lot of healing. It needs healing in finances. It needs healing in, in the way it deals with stress. It, de it needs healing in the way that we've polluted our world and we've destroyed it. And we've done it all for the sake of commerce, for the sake of, of giving everybody all of this stuff. There isn't any discipline. There isn't any real righteousness in the world about the way we're handling this planet. And as we look at the physical plane and we look at our planet, we can see it wheezing and gasping to try to keep up with the amount of pollutants that we're putting into the world. One of the things that astounds me is that, you know, recently, they, they became aware of the fact that the, um, that the ozone layer is breaking down around the planet. And um, it's basically because of the pollutants that are given off by the people that live on our, on our, on our planet. And the ozone layer is beginning to break down, and it's breaking down extremely ra rapidly. The CIA had a report in 1979 that said that the world would lose 2.5% of, of its ozone layer in, in approximately 40 years. And then as they watched this destruction of the ozone, they began to calculate it and watch it and, and, and see how it was developing. And it was found that we'd lost 2.5% of our ozone in three, three years. We'd lost 2.5% of our ozone in three years. And so as you look at that, you can see that the deterioration is incredibly quickly. Because it's incredibly quick because you're looking at, basically speaking, two generations from now not having any ozone. And the ozone is what protects the human skin from the ultraviolet rays of the, of the sun. And the skin is not made to have direct sunlight upon it like that. 
So as you look at that, and you can see this massive hole over the South Pole where there isn't any ozone at all, and the hole isn't some kind of little rinky-dink little donut, it's like tens of thousands of square miles wide, and it's drifting and moving all the time, so much so that the, um, the government of Argentina is extremely concerned because already now it's, it's affecting the, um, the population that lives in the south of their country, and uh, because that ozone cloud is kind of moving around in that area, and some of those people are experiencing, you know, very bright sunlight, instant suntan. And so as we look at our planet, we can see that as a group of people, we have got to do something about it. But to do something about it, we first have to become strong. And so my whole philosophy deals with pulling away a little bit, becoming powerful, seeing your life as this heroic goal, this heroic quest, you know, not being so sucked into what's going on around you just at this moment, becoming this powerful, creative individual, and then returning back and standing there for your people, for your tribe, for your nation, for those particular interests that you have at heart, and you stand there as this, this, this mega being, as this super being, what I call the super self, and you promote that and you express that, and other people will do what you're doing by watching your excellence, by watching the, the quintessence of humanhood that you've reached. As we look at that, we have to have a sort of a metaphysical overview of, of what we're doing here on the earth plane. And if you go out in the street and you ask 100 people, hey, what is the meaning of life? You get 99 people that go, huh? Because they don't know. And if you ask a group of people, hey, what do you think your life's purpose is? They also don't know. It's almost like you've been dropped off in this experiment and nobody told you what the experiment was about and nobody told you how to make it happen and nobody told you what success would be or failure would be. And so we're, like, there's all these people out there drifting. If you accept that your consciousness creates your reality, if you accept that what you feel about yourself is what you pull to you in the way of events, then you can see that you can alter your destiny. I don't think, let's say, a, a person in, in a forest, in a tribal society, has a lot of ability or a lot of metaphysical power with which to alter his destiny. But each one of you here have. You know, you're living in one of the fastest moving societies in the world. You're living in a, in, in country, in a country that, that has great capital, great power, tremendous movements, more art, more creativity than at any other time in the history of the world. And each one of you is a powerful being. Each one of you is coming to the point where you are closing out the physical experience. I personally believe in reincarnation, and I believe that you've come through maybe, you know, many thousands of, of, of years of various experiences on the physical plane. However, if you don't believe in reincarnation, it really doesn't matter because, you know, you're on the train, you know, whether you like it or not, you know. And if you believe in reincarnation, what you're saying is that the train stopped at other stops along the line. And if you don't believe in reincarnation, you just say, hey, I'm on the train. But either way, you can see that you have an ability now to basically wrap and pack who you are, to, to pick up the loose threads and to push it all together. And you don't have to become a great saint or a great master or a great anything to complete. All you have to do on the physical plane is basically get the message, you know, to get it, to experience it, to move away from fear, to move away from limitation and restriction, to move away from, from various forms of manipulation that are imposed upon you now and that you in turn oppose upon others that we all do, and to move out of that stuff and to become this incredibly fluid, radiant being with acute perceptions, acute perceptions, acute psychic perceptions, acute spiritual understanding of what's going on. The more you can resonate your feelings out into the universal law in an uncluttered way, without a whole bunch of opinion, without a whole bunch of stuff, without a whole bunch of philosophy, the more that universal law gives you back absolute clarity, gives you back the absolute purity of that divine power that is in all things. In order for me to get into the super self concept a little more, I think I should just, first of all, give you like 37 seconds of my meaning of life and just offer it to you for, my, for consideration. Of course, all of my philosophies are not, they're, they're not dogma. You know, I just offer it and you think about what suits you and what you don't like, you just can it. Basically speaking, I believe that you're not your body, you're not the color of your skin, you're not the religion you signed up for, you're not your sexuality, that you're none of that stuff, that in fact you're a divine spark of the universal mind inside a body. And that I believe you came to the physical plane and when you came or before you came, that divine spark inside of you that I call the higher self had an image or an understanding of what it was going to be getting into. That you didn't come to the physical plane in some kind of happenstance where suddenly plop, you know, they dropped you off in Ohio and you're sitting there in a wet diaper and you're thinking, bloody hell, what am I doing here? You know, I believe that, basically speaking, that power inside you is so great, 
it is so perceptive, it is a part of the divinity in all things, that it knew what the journey was going to be like. It would not necessarily know that at the age of 26 you'd uh, fall out of a cab drunk and break your leg, but it would know the, the masculine, the feminine, it would understand the parents, the tribe, and it would say, what are these experiences that I'm signing up for? And of course, as you look at the 4.9 billion people on our great planet, they all signed up for something different. There are no two people on the physical plane that have the same liver, that have the same eyes, that have the same culture, that have the same contents to their mind, and we're all different. There are 4.9 whatever billion experiments out there. And so as you understand that, you understand that your journey is absolutely unique. And even though you may seem or you may think at times that perhaps your life is somewhat mundane and somewhat humdrum, it isn't because you have an opportunity from the sort of the programming or the set of tumblers that you're particularly working with to, to come out of whatever position you find yourself in. What I think happens or what I perceive to happen is that this divinity inside you has a perception of what is, is happening on the physical plane or has a perception of a place that you can possibly evolve and looks at it and accepts that position as, as a growth experience. The weaknesses of the physical plane, the mayhem, the disease, the war, the famine, the, the inconsistencies are part of the beauty of what's going on here. If this place was a Garden of Eden and if it were perfect, you wouldn't have come. The whole point is that you can go out of this hole and you can go onto a freeway and you can jump the freeway and you can be hit by this semi-truck going to Tulsa and splatter yourself up against a concrete post. That is what makes life fun. That is the whole reason, that is the whole reason for being here. I mean, a tightrope walker, the whole point of a tightrope walker is that he can fall and he can smash every little bone in his body in the sawdust. And that's what makes it interesting. If you put the tightrope on the ground, everybody's going, whoa, 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 boring kind of show. So the whole point of the physical plane is the imbalance. And when you look at the physical plane and you look at the way people deal with the philosophy of it, you see all these people sort of moaning and groaning and saying, oh, if only it was different, if only there wasn't any war, if there only wasn't any disease, wouldn't it be marvelous if everybody had something to eat and this and that. And of course, all of those concepts are concepts that we can create as humans. We can create a world of plenty. We can create a world that's at peace. But the very fact that there isn't any peace gives us something to work on. You know, if you showed up and it was all peaceful and everybody was happy and they're all driving around in Porsches, you know, I mean, you, you commit suicide. You say, this place is so utterly boring, I'm off. And so as you look at the physical plane, the first way to detach from it is to understand that you can't understand it. That each person has a divine, this divine thing inside of themselves, and they are gonna, they're going to explain it to you in all sorts of religious and philosophical um, uh, terms, and in whatever terms they explain it to you, that's fine. And they, you don't know what they need. And so when you hear some incredibly gruesome thing where somebody got chopped up in a thousand pieces and got flicked off the roof one by one, or whatever it was, you know, you say, well, that's an interesting evolutionary experience, you know? <laughs> Very interesting. And you hear about a whole bunch of people that hit a mountain in Japan, and you say, that's an incredibly neat way of spending Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> because basically, if that infinity inside you is infinite, you're, you were infinite before you were born, you were infinite right now, and you're going to be infinite after you die. And you're never going to be more awake and alert and interested in things than the day that you actually kick the bucket, to use an English expression. But the day that you die, you're going to be intensely interested in this. And you're going to think, what a marvelous thing to do, you know? Instead of watching some stupid, maniacal TV show where everybody's blowing themselves up, I could actually blow myself up and find out how it feels. And this is really neat. And here I am standing outside of this body, this physical thing that I just rented for a little while, and isn't it neat, you know? And I don't get a bill, it'll just go back to where it came, and I can head off to higher ground. But the main thing is to create that power inside of you, to create that, 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 that energy inside of you now. When I, when I was first looking at altered states of consciousness, I kind of experimented in every wild and wonderful thing that I could get my hands on. And I trained as a medium at the College of Psychic Studies for a little while in that kind of English type of spiritual mediumship where you talk to the, to the souls of the departed, you know? And you would be sitting there and they'd bring you somebody in for this seance and you would, you know, their granny would show up or their aunt Maud would show up in the spirit world. And you'd see it as symbols in your mind eye, mind's eye. And, you know, like the Aunt Maud would give them a few symbols and they would recognize that it was Aunt Maud in the spirit world and everybody would go, how nice, and have another cup of tea and that kind of stuff. And then there was a point in that, in that sort of reading thing where it was customary to ask the spirit if they had anything that they wanted to say to the, to the, to the person that was still in the physical plane to encourage them upon their spiritual journey through life. And Aunt Maud would say something like, well, I know you've had a hard time, ducks, but it'll all be all right in three months and don't forget God loves you. 
And then they'd roll in another person, and they'd be sitting there, and we'd find his Uncle Fred, and Uncle Fred would talk about his experiences in the war or something, and the sitter would go, oh, yeah, that's where Uncle Fred was invalided out in Guildford, or whatever it was. And then at the end of the reading, you'd say, Uncle Fred, is there anything that you'd like to say to the sitter before we close out this reading? And Uncle Fred would say, listen, mate, I know you've had a hard life, and I know it's been terribly hard for you, and I know it's been a terrific struggle, but don't forget, it'll all be all right in three months, and God loves you. Well, anyway, I delivered about like maybe a hundred of these kinds of messages. And then one day, I was walking through the, the front um, door of the College of Psychic Studies, and it, I had this incredible realization that, basically speaking, if you're as thick as two planks, you know, when you're alive, you're as thick as two planks when you're dead. Because none of these spirits, none of these spirits and dearly departed people had a, had a clue as to what was going on. So I decided to set... They didn't. And isn't it true? I mean, it's, it's human nature to give advice, you know? I mean, how many times have you stopped somebody in the street and you've said to them, excuse me, but could you tell me how to get to downtown? And the guy hasn't got a clue. But he says, yeah, make a left, make a right, make a left, make a right. And, and they don't want to tell you, I don't know how to get to downtown, you know? And it's a bit like that. You know, these spirits would give you information. They haven't got a bloody clue, but that was okay. They gave you the information. So they want to be helpful. So what happened was that I came to this realization that if you don't develop your power now, you know, when do you get to develop it? I don't believe that when you die, this transcendence is suddenly there. I think you enter into dimensions of consciousness that have a higher state of perception, but those dimensions of consciousness don't have all the answers. And you only have to look at some of the stuff that's coming down today from the people that are channeling this and channeling that and these spirit mediums and so on. And you read that stuff, and it's kind of really what I would call yawnsome, because it's a bit sort of like, oh, you know, the voice of God speaks, and it's this cracky. If this is all that the voice of God's got to say, it's incredibly boring, because obviously whoever's channeling doesn't really have any more clue than any of us, or often they don't anyway. So as you look at that, you're looking at a lifetime here where you find yourself in this incredible situation, and you only have a short period of time to get it together. You know, if you're not prepared to rise up out of your seat today and leave this place and really begin, you know, when are you going to begin? And when you look at the people of the world, they drift. And they drift all of the time. There's never sort of like, there's never sort of, doesn't seem to be any hurry up about getting their act together. Well, I'll start next week, I'll start next month. As I looked at that, I thought, heck, I want to get involved in making sure that I have as much power as I can possibly muster as fast as possible. And what happened to me was that as I took on some of these philosophies and concepts for myself, I found that my perception increased dramatically. Not only like a psychic perception of understanding what's going on, but my perception of people and situations. I could look at a person and I could watch their feelings and I could see what it was they were. What, you know, what they needed in life, what their strong points were, what their weaknesses were. And I know that each, as each one of you opens to become more of this life force, to become more of this divinity within you, all of you will experience that same type of heightened perception. And I've watched it go on for, with thousands and thousands of people, where you move into it, and it's not really clairvoyance. It's like this steady type of inner knowing. It's information coming into you all of the time about every situation. And as you're going into a negotiation, you can watch the feelings of the person you're negotiating with, and you know what they're going to say next. You know, as you get on an aircraft, you know whether that feels okay or it doesn't. You understand. It's a way of relating to your families and your children. It's a way of understanding finances. So finances isn't just beating around in the marketplace, but it's like a fluid moving to where the honeypot is, and then away again, and then back into the honeypot, and away again. And we're looking at that kind of fluidity, that kind of simplicity to life. Okay. When you look at the world today, you can see that there's an awful lot of incredibly loving and incredibly genuine people out there. And they pray, and they visualize, and they do the great alfalfa sprout up the nose religion, and they stand on their head, and they, and they read the books, and, 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 they, and they do all of that stuff. And then they put these thought forms out into the universal law, and they experience utter silence. Nothing happens. You know, they didn't get it. It doesn't show up. The opportunity isn't there. And when I looked at that, I thought, now, wait a minute. If the universal law, if you will accept total responsibility for your life, and if you will understand that this power, this life force around you, is reflecting back to you exactly what you put in, then how come the stuff you're putting in isn't getting you what you want? You know, how come you don't get those things? I mean, why can't you just think, you know, sports car and find it there on the sidewalk? And so as I looked at that, I thought, there must be rules and regulations that allow us to explain what is going on. 
And of course, the very first thing that each one of us deals with is a limitation about what it is we feel about ourselves. And you can say to somebody, you are the product of your belief patterns, and they'll go, yes. And you can say, and you're the product of your feelings and your, and your programming and your conditioning, and they'll go, yes. But it's different to say yes and then actually do something about it. You know, where you're absolutely prepared to turn and face yourself. The initiate, the warrior's way, is a way where you turn and you face yourself. You're not embarrassed about who you are. You're not embarrassed about how far you've come or haven't come. You're just happy to look at your strengths and weaknesses and to work upon them. And of course, the universal law in its magnanimousness and in its beauty will give you back anything that you put in that you feel to be true. Those philosophies that say that what you think is what you get are only sort of half right because mainly the thought forms go in to create your feelings and your feelings resonate a kind of thumbprint. It's, a, it's, it's this cloud around you that you resonate and every moment of every second of the day you're putting that out into the universal law and the universal law is giving it you back, you know? So like the average human being puts out like, you know, give me struggle. You know, give me plenty of struggle here. And the universal law in its loveliness and its kindness and its friendship to you says, well, you know, what kind of struggle do you want? And we say, well, how's about constant struggle? You know, and so <laughs> the universal law says, no problem. Constant struggle, we're going to arrange it. You know, and so, you know, the shelf falls off the, the wall in the kitchen, kills the cat. The car won't start. You get a demand in from the tax man. You know, you slip on the pathway and sprain your ankle. And it's still only 10 past 9. And you think, ah, oh, this is totally perfect. This is marvelous. This is working out exactly the way I expect it to work out. And you would say to yourself, but why am I putting in for constant struggle? And you're putting in for constant struggle because your mother and father put in for constant struggle. And as that divine little spark came into the physical plane, it had a perception of what it was going to be getting into. And I believe also it had a perception of the mindset of the mother and father. It had a perception of the tribe and the philosophy, and it signed up for it. Because it really doesn't matter what kind of wacko philosophy you signed up for, because if you didn't sign up for it, you wouldn't have anything to work on. And so this higher self or this divine spark will look, will look at the situation and we'll look at what's going on and we'll say, God, this is perfect. Look at, look at my prospective dad, you know? An absolute plank. I mean, that guy, I mean, you know, there's no action, there's no life force, you know? The, I mean, he's just lying on this couch. In fact, I think it's part of his body. And <laughs> he's drinking too much and he's none too together and he, he doesn't know how to relate to my mum. He'll be perfect, give me him, because it'll take me 20 years to go past that. You know, if that's how weak if that's how weak an understanding of masculinity, you know, that'll be perfect for me. That's 20 years there. And then the higher self looks at the mother, you know, and the mother's this lovely lady, totally spacey, absolutely not nailed down, total space cadet, and the higher self says, perfect, she'll be marvelous. Look at that for femininity. That'll take me another 20 years to go past that. And so it signs up for that. And then it takes a little look at what these two lovely characters believe. Okay, like, what do they actually believe? And they'll believe this incredibly wonderful, wacko thing that they've grabbed from here and pulled from there, and their whole belief pattern will be incredibly debilitating and disenfranchising and, and, and not empowering and full of fear and full of obligation and goodness knows what else. And the higher self looks at that and says, oh, that's perfect. 20 years to get, get past him, 20 years to get past her, 20 years to get past the philosophy, and then I'll have 10 years to myself. And so... <laughs> And so whatever you signed up for, whatever belief patterns you signed up for, are part of the joy of being here. And all of us carry these incredibly bizarre beliefs that don't have anything to do with power or love or friendship or becoming what it is you want to become. They're these sort of suitcases, you know? They're these stuff that they put on your little car and you're supposed to sort of like haul them through life, you know? It's almost as if, as if metaphysically somebody comes along and they clip this dead horse to your leg, you know, when you're born and they say, right, get out of that, you know? And you, you haul this leg around, you, you know, you haul this dead horse around with this, with this, you know, your leg chained to this horse and you say, this is perfect, I can hardly move. There's a thousand regulations, there's a thousand guilt manipulations, there's a thousand feelings about money, there's a thousand feelings about God, this will be perfect, this will be utterly wonderful. And we came with that, and you did, and I did, and we all have our little trips. The name of the game is to begin to disengage from those belief patterns. And it isn't that difficult, it's just a matter of agreeing to get on and beyond your stuff, to get on and beyond your opinion. And as you look at the physical plane, you understand that like we teach our people that they've got to have an opinion, that they've got to defend their opinion, that there has to be a debate about their opinion. 
But in fact, the more opinions you have, the more beliefs you have, the more stuff you carry. The sage is a fluid movement through the physical plane. The sage believes in the sanctity of all things. It believes in allowing things to be whatever they are. It believes in, in, in love and in warmth and in kindness, in non-interference. But the point is, you can only get to that point of energy or that, that, that super self-energy within when you can disengage from all the weaknesses of the people. Because the physical plane, the actual people, are incredibly weak. And we're living in the strongest example of those people. The rest of them, forget it, you know? Forget it. And when you look at the people, they don't have power. You know, they don't control their own lives. And so here we're looking at today is getting your power back. And you all have worked upon yourselves and got some of it back. And now it's time to basically get the rest of it back. And you getting your power back is not necessarily threatening to those other people. Because you're not going to go into society and start beating up on them and say, hey guys, you're not doing it right, you've got to follow my philosophy, you've got to follow my way. What you do is you just gently withdraw out of your society. You basically retreat backwards. It's like walking backwards and facing frontwards. So gradually they don't really know that you're going. But eventually you're over the horizon, you know? And you've totally disappeared on them. Okay? And they say, whatever happened to Harry? You know, he was here a minute ago. <laughs> First and foremost, the power that your consciousness has is directly linked to the amount of life force you express. And that life force is, is basically resonating through your body. It's resonating in the physical molecules of your physical body, but it's also resonating through your emotions and your thought patterns and the way that you deal with your life. Whether you deal with your life in a disciplined, warrior's way, in an honorable way, in a fluid way, or whether your life is this flip-flop pattern that you got from your mother, where you're sort of bouncing off the walls like this billiard ball that's run amok. And if you look at that, you can understand that most people don't realize that. You, they, they don't understand that, say, for example, as they're going for a new job or a new opportunity in life, that it's linked into how they look, how strong their body is, you know, how much power they have. They think that some kind of chance or luck is doing it to them. The conscious evolving being doesn't believe in chance. She or he understands that she has the power to create anything they want. A person that's totally out of control and believes in all sorts of forces manipulating her or him, they have chance, they have luck. You know, and those kind of guys, they better come out of the house in the morning and rub the little rabbit's foot and do the little beads and, and do their little affirmations and put on a little suit of armor and get their insurance policy and get in the car because they're going to need it. You know, they're going to really need it. But the evolving being, because they're walking in a measured way through the physical plane, and because they've understood how to use power and they're not scared of it, those people can literally create their own destiny. And that's you. That's us. We have the ability to develop a utopia right here. The golden age isn't something that's going to sort of flutter down from the sky someday. It's basically a whole bunch of people getting up and saying, I claim my right to this golden age. I claim my right to absolute transcendence, to absolute power, to a life beyond fear, to a life of love, to a life where we are this brotherhood of man and we are creating our own destiny. And when enough people get to that conclusion, then the planet will change. And it'll be a neat day. It'll be Tuesday afternoon, 3.15. <laughs> it's changed at last. You go, phew, thank God for that. We can all sit down. Okay. As you look at that life force, you've got your physical body first and foremost. Obviously, if that is falling apart, Never mind transcendence, never mind this heroic path. You've got to look at that physical body and try to do something about it right away. Because if it conks out, you know, the game's over for you. Okay, so that's the very first place. The very first place is to put power into making that body strong. Some of us are born strong, some of us aren't. And so if your body is weaker than, it, than normal, then that's part of the beauty that you accepted. And you'll have strong places. You know, maybe your emotions don't flop around so much. You know, maybe you've got very nice or very strong intellect instead of a strong body. But each one of us has, has strong parts and weak parts. And then as you look at your physical body, you have to then understand that your emotions are intimately linked to this life force thing as well. And your emotions do more to destroy the life force contents of your life than almost anything else. Because you'll start out on the day and you'll go out and you'll be feeling good about yourself and then suddenly there'll be some kind of emotional hassle or some emotional confrontation and, and the whole of the energy of what you are is destroyed. But if you're beginning to pull out of things, if you're beginning to pull out of opinion, you're not so intimately involved in the emotions of it. You can set upon a quest and you can say, within six months, I want to be out of de debt and I want to open a pizza parlor in Bujumbura. And you head off, okay? 
now, to have that in your mind and to have that in your visualization is great, but also you're going to be open to not getting that. Uh, on, you know, on your way to the airport, something may happen and you might wind up in New York. So you can put these goals out ahead of yourself, but you don't lock emotion into the goal. You just allow yourself to move fluidly towards it and pick up whatever experience happens to be there as you're going along. So often as we go out in the physical plane, we put an idea for our life, like, hey, I'd like to be thinner. You know, I'd like to have a more loving relationship. I'd like to have children or whatever it is. And then we get incredibly frustrated and emotional if it doesn't happen. And the name of the game, basically, is to begin to pull out of emotion to stay calm and to not have such an opinion about what's going on. And when you don't have an opinion, you're happy. Because if you think about it, we live, do we not, in like an eternal now. The subconscious mind has an illusion of these days rolling one after the next. But in fact, what we are is this infinite being in an infinite time frame. And so if you're feeling lousy right now, you're feeling lousy infinitely in all directions. If you feel poor right now, you are infinitely poor. It's not like, well, I'll feel poor right now, and then later on when you give me a million dollars, I'll feel rich. You'll never get the million dollars. If you want to be rich, you've got to resonate rich. You've got to have calm emotions to allow that divinity to come forward. The whole of the physical plane is basically this electromagnetic field that we create around ourselves, and we create it through, the, through our feelings and through the electromagnetic impulses of the brain. And that field that's around us as humans cuts us off from the life force. It cuts us off from a perception of God because, basically speaking, the molecules in the brain are oscillating. If you're in the waking state, you know, those, they're, they're oscillating between, say, 14 to 22 cycles a second, and that's what cuts you off from your heritage. But the light is shining all the time. That infinity is there all the time. And if you can align to that infinity and start coming out of infinite, then your whole life becomes more infinite. It's a bit like the sunshine. You know, we all want the sun to shine, and when it doesn't shine, we blame the sun. But it's nothing to do with the sun, it's the clouds. It's, and, and it's not even anything to do with the clouds. It's our position in relation to those clouds. Because if it's raining, you know, if it's raining right here in this city, what stops you going down to the Sahara? And then it's really sunny down there, you know? <laughs> or what's, what stops you going down to, to the desert someplace, you know? And there you are in Death Valley or wherever you are, and it's really sunny. But in fact, you know, we tend to think that like it's something to do with the sun and the clouds. It's not, it's us. And that light is shining inside you, and all we're looking at is trying to develop a philosophy where you're constantly in the sunshine rather than creating this cloud of feelings around you. Moving on from emotions, the very next thing that we're looking at is basically developing a clear mentality. And often males, for example, get very, very wrapped up in the facts. You know, and they've got to have a thousand facts and a thousand logical ways of handling it. And of course, life isn't logical and energy isn't logical, and things don't necessarily always work logically. And so what I say to people is, yes, yeah, sure, collect the facts, but also be prepared to allow this spontaneity to become a part of your life. If you come out of life too logically and too mental, there's a tendency for everything to become so structured that you can't move. You know, you, you begin to sort of develop this lifestyle where like Monday's wash day and Tuesday's meatloaf and Wednesday's dynasty and like nothing ever changes, you know? And so we're, we're looking at trying to look at that mentality and saying, hey, I've got the facts, I've got the knowledge, I've got my university degree or whatever it is, but I'm also open to accepting something totally different and spontaneous to come into my life. And then as you begin to look at this and you can see that all of these things are basically a way of pulling out, you begin to develop a philosophy of self. And a philosophy of self is basically you creating a kind of religion for yourself, whatever that religion might be. And it can be as wacko as you like, as long as it works for you. You know, the question is, hey, does this thing work for me? And so you can get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you can fire yourself a bacon sandwich and you can put a chocolate bar in it and some alpha alpha sprouts on top of that and two dollops of mustard and then you put two ping pong balls both ends of the sandwich and you eat it. And people say, are you out of your mind? You say, no, that's my philosophy. I feel good eating this stuff. And, and it's a complete protein. You know, it's the ping pong balls that make it a complete protein. And, and it's great. And that's what I like to do, you know? And then I like to stand on my head on the roof and play my trumpet till dawn. And then I'm, I'm totally empowered and I'm ready to totally win the world's heart and their love for me. And whatever it might be. But as you develop a philosophy, what I suggest is look at the great teachers, look at the great masters, look at the religious and the holy teachings, and take those things that empower you, that make you feel good. Anything that's designed to restrict you or manipulate you or stick you in a corner, then dump that stuff. You know, dump it, and if you're not comfortable dumping it all on one morning, just junk little bits as you go along. Imagine yourself this ship at sea, and every so often you toss another bit of garbage out. And as you develop a philosophy, then what happens is you're pulling out of where the people are. And you can't get to a higher ground without pulling out of where the people are. 
You haven't got any options. It's a bit like you can't flow down the river if you're hanging on to the side. You have to release and allow that the incredible power in all things and the incredible beauty in all things will sustain you, will protect you, and will allow you to move fluidly on. You will not necessarily be able to see what's going to happen in six months' time or a year's time, and what if, and if I do this, and this happens, then I'll go over here, and then that'll happen. What you have to do is literally cast your fate out there, but not in the sense of like tossing your power away, but you move forward with your power right there saying, because of my energy, because of my heroic transcendence, because of this warrior discipline I feel inside of myself, I know it'll be fine when I get to Bujumbura by the very fact that I'm standing in Bujumbura, that my energy is strong and resonating and all the people I need and all the stuff that I need for my own survival will be there and I will be able to provide for myself and for my loved ones and for those causes and those institutions that I care for that I choose to support. As you develop this philosophy, then the very last point of this is that you have to have like this infinite overview of life. You have to have a spiritual perception that doesn't come from judgment that doesn't come from criticism, that doesn't come from opinion. Because once you get into criticism and judgment and opinion, then you're locking yourself right back down to where everybody else is. If you could meet like an incredibly supreme being, you know, and this supreme being would like sort of flutter, 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 end up in the kitchen, they wouldn't have an opinion about you. They would just radiate their absolute acceptance of you. And once you've learned to radiate a love and acceptance of yourself, then you can radiate and accept the rest of the world. Now, obviously, when you look at the violence and the mayhem of the world, it takes you a while to see that there's beauty in that. You know, how do I accept this? This is contrary to my morality. Or how do I accept that? It seems to me like it's evil. But you have to understand that all of those people are basically coming together, and they're coming up bit by bit, given time. You know, given time. And it isn't for you to have to go fix it. You can't go to somebody who is evil and say to them, stop being evil. You can't go to, say, let's say, a teenager that's taking dope and say to them, hey, guy, you know, stop taking dope. I mean, that isn't going to work. What you have to do is get around them, love them, and bring them gradually out to something else. And you'll be able to do that. As you develop your power, as you develop your, pe your perception so they're really cu acute, so that you can look at people and you know, you can look at situations, you can feel the future all around you, you'll be able to change people, but you'll be able to change them from strength and love. And the way you change things is from within. You can never dictate or, or force or push because then the people's feelings get mangled. And what you're doing is you're swapping the manipulation that they're in right now, the restriction that they're in right now, for a different restriction, which happens to be yours. Okay? And that's often what happens in a lot of philosophies. You dump one bunch of total garbage, but you sign up for another. So as we look at that, we understand that if you can come out of infinity, absolute infinite love and acceptance, and if you can see your life in, as infinite, even though at times it may not be, then what happens is that gradually you become congruent with that infinity within you. And congruence means that your energy and the infinity all around you is one and the same energy. Okay, you can't say, I want to go to a higher ground, and you continue to live and act the way that you've always lived and acted. To go to a higher ground, you have to develop that ability to be able to let go, release, and come to some new arrangement with yourself. When you look at our lives, my life, your life, often they are so intensely complicated. The relationships, the financial arrangements, the structure, the kids, the mortgage, the car payments. When you look at those lives, you can see how difficult it is for the life force or the God force to shine through. It's a bit like, you know when you see two people talking in the street, or you see a person talking who has a tremendous amount of opinion about something, okay? Now you try going up to that person and telling them something different. You know, they don't hear you. You know, the, the lights are on, but there's nobody home, you know? It's like they don't, they don't hear you. When I imagine yourself, you imagine this divinity trying to radiate through your life, trying to make it more transcendent, and you have all of this stuff. You know, you have all of the stuff you bought, the Porsche and the spa and the new carpet and the little escalator for the canary, and you've got all this stuff, okay? And it's important to you. And then you've got your opinions and you've got a philosophy to defend and you've got your ideas about the children and you've got this and that and your obligations and the guilt patterns and all the things you're supposed to do. And you imagine this life force saying, gosh, if I could only just squeak into her life for a moment, you know, it'd be marvelous. But I can't because the complexity of it makes it impossible. 
And so as you're looking at trying to move towards a higher ground, to a place where you have this psychic perception, where you have this, this transcendent all-knowing, you're going to have to de-escalate your lifestyle. You're going to have to make it less complex. Look at those things that are truly important for you and go in for them. Okay, and maybe you may like to get around a kitchen table and discuss it with your family and with your loved ones and say, listen, heck, what is important? And suddenly you all realize that the little escalator for the canary really wasn't that important because the escalator could, the, the canary could, because the canary could hop up onto the perch anyway, and you, you sell it and you do something different. But as you look at the complexity of human life, you can see how this God force or this life force that's trying to get into your life, I mean, takes like the, the lowest place on the totem pole. As you begin to resonate and as you begin to express your power, the oscillation or the vibrations that you express begins to move up. And you look at the physical plane out there and you look at the man in the street and let us just say hypothetically he's oscillating at let's say 20,000 cycles a second. Okay, realizing that I'm just picking these figures out of the sky. It's just a way of having a term of reference or a place to sort of put you, hang your hat. Let's say that the average person has his 20,000 cycles a second of life force. That life force is encrusted by all of this stuff. As he or she begins to throw the stuff out, out, and as he or she begins to become congruent with the infinity inside of themselves, and as they begin to heal themselves and forgive themselves, and see, see the, the machinations of the physical plane as beautiful, their energy begins to move up. And as they begin to oscillate from 20,000 cycles a second to 30 and 40 and 50, they get into a point where they can control their destiny, where they can create a thought form and then boom, there it is right in front of them, instantly, no effort you know, where they can control their physical body, where they're oscillating at a vibrational rate higher than the others. Again, always the same life force, always the same energy, but it's like having a cup of water or having a 50-gallon tank. It's always water, but you've got more to mess around with. And as you begin to do that, the opportunities that are out there for you, that are sort of waiting for you to get your act together, will begin to plop, plop into your life, will begin to sort of jump and be there with you. You can't see from where you're oscillating now necessarily where you could reach in five years because you can't see a move to Peru and falling in love with this guy that's a uh, second-hand uh, llama salesman in Peru and, and then him dying and leaving you a herd of llamas and you selling the herd of llamas and winding up on a Russian fishing boat and the boat's sinking and you swim into a little island that was made of gold. You know, and you can't see it. I mean, there's all these circumstances between you and that. You can't even fathom how it's going to work. So as you begin to understand the, the necessity for you to move into power and to begin to move this consciousness forward, you have to, as you're walking upon this path, walking upon this dedication, constantly choose those things that honor you, that are energetic for you, that are powerful for you. And it amazes me how many people don't choose that. They choose weak situations. They choose situations where in a workplace, say, they're manipulated like crazy. They choose restriction in marriage and human relationships. They, they choose manipulation when they're the boss and they need to feel the need to manipulate everybody like crazy to get them to do it. You know, they choose difficulty. They choose struggle. Each one of you, every single day of your life, has a variety of choices to make. And it's a lot of choices. And you always want to move towards, is this powerful? Does this empower me? Is this loving and fresh and open and free? Or is it restrictive and grody and lousy and, and not making me happy? Because you have a responsibility to make yourself happy. You have a responsibility to find life this exhilarating journey of laughter and casualness and fluidity, and that's what we're moving towards. As you then begin to get this idea that you have to make choices, you're going to have people perhaps react to those choices. And it's very important that you realize that your evolution, your, your journey through this incredible thing is nothing to do with anyone else. You may be together with other people in a family, with loved ones, with your children, but in the end, you, and only you, is responsible for your own evolution. And you can't live your life the way your mommy and daddy want you to live it, or the way the people at the office say you gotta live it, or the way society says you gotta live it. You gotta live it for yourself. And I believe that the conscious individual will not obviously do things that are going to create a problem or create a difficulty. The conscious individual is not going to infringe or, or, or make things you know, happen that, that there will be a reaction to. They're just going to fluidly move through, but you are not living it for anyone else. And what other people think about your life and think about your decisions is their problem. And it isn't anything to do with you at all. Not at all. 
And if they come up to you and they say they think, they, they, and if they come up to you and they say, "Listen, I think your decision to move to Bujumbura absolutely stinks, and I think you're a lousy mother because of this and because of that, and I think you're terrible," you just say, "Thank you for sharing it. I appreciate your opinion, but I'm leaving for Bujumbura in an hour." And if they come along and they judge you, if they come along and they judge you and they tell you you're no good, you, all you're doing is watching somebody with a more limited perception than yourself. Okay, coming out of their more limited energy pattern. And their more limited energy pattern is going to have opinions that are not your opinions. And people will judge you. And they will criticize you. You know, and you just sit there and you say, well, I appreciate your opinion. You know, I particularly like the way you criticize and judge me. I like the way you smile as you do it. <laughs> I particularly like the way that cockroach walked around the glass, your coffee cup, as you were talking, you know? <laughs> there was something very... There was something very transcendent about that. There was something emotional, you know? I particularly like the bit where it stopped round about the handle and peed in your cup, you know? <laughs> you missed it because you were in the judgment and the criticism. You would have liked it. Not a lot, but you would have liked it. <laughs> and you move out. And so often our life is dominated by what our workmates think or what our husbands think or our wives or the kids or society or the institutions. You're free. You make your own decisions. The only thing you have to worry about is basically being respectful for the transcendence of everybody. You know, being aligned to the divinity in all things. And then as you begin to create this new reality of yourself, then you begin to bring everything in your life to sort of a more real position. So often people come out of projecting for something, praying for something, visualizing for something, and it isn't real in their feelings. And they live a lifestyle that isn't real. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a thing that I call variance. And what variance is, is it's the difference between what you really are and what you think you are. And each one of us has an opinion about what we think we are. Okay? The divinity inside of you is real. It can only come out of naturalness, holiness, moving towards this loving being that it's creating for itself. The ego, or the persona, as Jung calls it, will have a thousand opinions about how much money you're supposed to earn and how good a lover you're supposed to be and what kind of person you're supposed to be and how intelligent you are and whether you're a good mum or not a good mum or whatever. But the ego will always have a different opinion to what is real, especially in a person that hasn't worked upon their life. And as you begin to see this goal as a heroic goal, you begin to make what you actually are, the real you, and what you think you are, one and the same. And so you're going to come out of a naturalness of not having to explain things to people. You're going to have to come out of a naturalness of not being embarrassed. You're not worried about your decisions. You just are what you are. And you're a child of the universe. You stand in front of this life force, a child of the universe. You can't make excuses. You can't be more than you are yet. You know, you are what you are. And that's what I am, man. And that's just how you explain it to yourself. You know, and so as you come out of that variance and you come back to what is real, then all of a sudden you begin to empower your consciousness because you're resonating from the seat of your own power. So many people are so far away from what is real that when they try to blip out thought forms, the thought forms don't have any power. And you can see that in the way people handle money. You know, what is real is how much money do you have and how much money you're earning. And you look at people taking credit and taking borrowing of one kind of another and moving from the center that's real and it's going way out here someplace and creating a variance or a gap between the two. And they're spending at this level here and what's real is here. And the difference between these two causes tremendous tension and tremendous difficulty to the point where that when this person's out here, you know, hoping for more money, visualizing for more money, doing the affirmations, doing the meditations, you know, they're coming out of, of having so little power because they're not in the center. They're not where the power is. They're in this fake lifestyle. And when you have your life, if when you have your life and it is fake, it isn't real, you can't just go up to people and say, I am what I am. I don't make any apologies. You, 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 you disjoint yourself away from where your power section is. And that causes people to lose that resonance inside of you. Because each one of you right here has an ability right now to resonate this power inside of you, to concentrate it, concentrate on it, and get absolutely what you want. And if you haven't got what you want, then you've got to need to work upon yourself. Because your metaphysical bank balance, the balance or the bank balance that describes your power is the time lag between you conceiving something and it arriving in your life. So if you think sports car and it runs over your foot in 30 seconds, oh, pretty strong day. If you think sports car and like nine generations later you're still, you know, riding in a buggy, it's like, oh, where's my power? 
as all of you get into this mode and to begin to concentrate upon yourself and only yourself, never mind everything else, just you, what's important on you and what's important for you, then you begin to bring all of your energy from this variance out there right back into the center. When you look at people and you talk to people, they all want to help the world. They all want to save the world. They all want world peace. They all want to feed the children. Of course they do. But what are you going to feed them if you haven't got any money? What power are you going to transfer to people if you haven't got power? What perception will you lay upon your tribe, your society, if you haven't got perception yourself? And so we're looking at coming back out of all of that stuff, coming in the middle and working upon yourself. An act of concentration, an act of loving yourself. And as you get into that love and you get into that concentration, the power inside you oscillates faster and faster because you've brought it back from all over everywhere and you can begin to use your consciousness as this laser beam of intention where if you put your mind on something, it'll blip and it'll blip up in your life and it'll be easy, simple and quick. And as you begin to do that, you begin to resonate a whole difference, a whole power. It's almost as if the golden age begins inside of you when you're happy with yourself, accepting of yourself, non-judgmental, non-critical, where you are prepared to concentrate upon yourself. And people say to me, well, Stuart, isn't that like egotistic? Isn't that sort of, you know, just looking after yourself? What about the world? You can't give anything to the world very much of any kind of its significance until you become powerful, until you are disciplined. You can't heal if your body's falling apart. You know, you can't take the children in your arms and soothe their feelings if you're bouncing off the wall. You can't feed the hungry if you haven't got any moolah or cash with which to feed them, you know? And so we're looking at creating a society of individuals that will pull in, that will understand these concepts, and that will work upon themselves. Let's just talk for a moment or two about variance some more, because it's a concept that's not real easy to grip the first time you hear it. Basically speaking, variance is the difference between what is true, what is loving, and what is real that's inside of you, and what you think about yourself. And obviously, that many times, that will be totally different and at variance with or different to the real you. One of the aspects of variance that is very, very common, of course, as I said, was money, where people are spending much more money than what is true in their life. The other aspect of variance, which is very common also, is the way that as individuals we deal with time. I spoke a few moments ago about the infinity inside of you. You're living in this eternal now, and you're just moving from one concept of the eternal now into another concept of the eternal now, constantly in the now. Any feeling that you can resonate inside of yourself becomes eternal. You can't say, one day I will be rich, because the universal law hasn't got a clue what that means. You can't say, one day I will heal my body, one day I will convert this relationship into this grody mess and bring it into something really transcendent and beautiful. As you understand that, you have to resonate those feelings now. It's a kind of sort of metaphysical fake it till you make it. You know, there is this energy and you've got to begin to believe it. First of all, your mind won't believe it, and secondarily, your whole feelings won't believe it unless you can begin to resonate it. The ego likes to live in the future. You know, it likes to think in terms of, well, next month and next year I'll make more money. You know, and next year I'm going to take a vacation. Next year or next week this will happen to me. And the reason it likes to live in the future is because basically speaking, it doesn't have to do anything about it. You know, next year I'll make some more money it means that right now I can sit around on this couch and do nothing. Okay? Next year I will create this for myself is a way of saying it will never happen. And the universal law knows that, or at least the, the way that the life force works is, it reflects whatever is, is in, is reflect, it reflects whatever is in your feelings right now. And so it cannot reflect to you a future self, because in many ways there isn't a future self. In so much as, let's say, for example, a small acorn, acorn will become an oak tree eventually, that's really how your life is, but the oak tree is already inside that acorn. You know, it's already inside that seed. And so you have to create the seed of this magnificent lifestyle, this magnificent freedom, the fluidity, the love, the, the lack of infringement, the power right now, here and, here and now, today, in this room, and decide that for yourself. This is a choice that I've made for myself. The very fact that my life does not as yet reflect all these really neat things, the fact that my perceptions are not as acute as they may be, is just a matter of my gradual sense of becoming. And then when you can put it in your feelings and resonate it over a period of time, all of the people that interact with you, all of the situations that come at you, all the power that is there begins to gradually change you. 
but it's a bit like having a bucket of muddy water. You can't put, like, let's say, another, another can of water inside that bucket and change it that quickly. Bit by bit, the mud falls to the bottom eventually. And I believe the important thing is to identify your strengths and go for making those strengths stronger. If you work on your weaknesses, if you concentrate and think, oh, God, I've got to get beyond this really lousy habit I've got of, like, eating the cat every morning or beating up on a canary or whatever it is, then what happens is that but the very fact that you're concentrating on your weaknesses actually makes you weaker. If your body is sick and you concentrate on the sickness, it gets sicker, doesn't it? It's almost like it has to get sicker before you can begin becoming, to become well. And that's how it happens. And so I don't believe in like working so much on the weaknesses, but more in terms of deciding what the strengths are and then going for those strengths. Going for those things that make you happy, that make you strong, constantly deciding, constantly moving towards what is power for me? What is freedom for me? How can I relate in this situation so that it honors me? To do that, I believe that you're going to have to become self-employed or at least be in a situation where you are contracting your labor to whatever it might be. Because when you're not self-employed or you're not working as a subcontractor, then you're in the mindset and the destiny of the corporation that you work for. And they're making decisions which are not based on your needs. They're making decisions, and rightly so, that are based on their needs. They've empowered themselves and they're working whatever way they want to work. But I think that each one of us needs to look at, at becoming financially independent. You know, and that doesn't mean being a millionaire. It doesn't mean having, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars every month, but where you control yourself. And if you are in a situation where you are working for a corporation, then what you may want to do is to begin to develop investments or a sideline business so that corporation isn't the sum total of all of the finances that you receive. Because when you give away your power to somebody else, then you've got to be careful about that. Now, some of you, as you're developing, as you're learning, as you're moving through life, you may want to work for a corporation or work for an institution of one kind or another as you are building your own self-reliance. But we're looking at a world today where a lot of the financial institutions are coming under tremendous pressure, much more than they will ever tell the common people. They're coming under tremendous pressure, tremendous difficulty, and that difficulty will be reflected in the way that we all do business. And if you are not independent, you may find yourself literally being carried down a sort of a sea of destiny or a river of destiny that may or not, ha may not have your interests at heart. As you begin to come out of what is real, what is true, then the very next point that you're going to begin to develop in your life is moving into the eternal now. So that you're not fretting and worrying about what's coming next week. You're not worrying about what will happen in nine years' time, what will happen when I retire, what will happen if and what and however. All you're looking at is, am I having a right, nice time right now? You know, am I having a nice time right now or am I not having a nice time? Is this situation powerful and loving or isn't it? And as you move back out of the future and into the now, you move out of variance even further and back into where the real power lies. As I said, the ego loves the future because it doesn't have to do anything about it. It can just fantasize. And those fantasies release energy from your consciousness. And if you fantasize, let's say, about a day at the beach, and you say, we're going to go to the beach, and we'll get the truck, and we'll load up the sandwiches, and we'll have beer and champagne and, and steaks, and we'll have a cookout, and we'll swim, and want to be amazing, and Harry's coming, and Sue's coming. As you all discuss it, you take energy out of the event. And isn't it true that when you roll up for the day at the beach, it's like, oh, 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 oh a day at the beach. You know, it, it doesn't have the spontaneity. The very nicest things that happen to us as humans is when, you know, you're heading to the office and suddenly you think, oh, I'll have a day at the beach. And off you go. It's a totally <laughs> spontaneous thing, right? And it's spontaneous and you meet two or three people on the way there and you meet a guy that, that owns a beer truck and he says he'll come and all of a sudden there's this incredible day at the beach. And folks say, what happened to you yesterday? You say, well, I just had this spontaneous feeling. I was on heading off to the office in the middle of all of that. I came to the beach. Okay, as you look at that and you come back into the now, you begin to resonate power. The other place that the ego likes to live in is in the past. And the reason why it lives in the past is because, again, it doesn't have to do very much about it. And so the ego can say, do you remember the golden days of music, the golden days of when we were children and we were at high school and wasn't it fun and wasn't it carefree? Do you remember how wonderful our lives were? And what the ego does is it goes to the past, it remembers the past, and it has a little way of kind of dry cleaning it. 
It takes out all the lousy bits, all the bits that didn't work, all the bits of what you hated, that you felt uncomfortable about, and it dry cleans the past and says, wasn't it wonderful? Wasn't it fantastic? And that's particularly so for folk that are older. The older they get, the more habit they have to drop back into the past and say, wasn't it marvelous? Of course, it wasn't marvelous. It was just another day like today. And so you've got this situation where the personality or the ego or the persona, as Jung would call it, is either flipping you off into the future where it doesn't have to do anything, or it's dragging you back into the past where it's dry cleaned everything to make it look rosy. And none of those situations are real. They're both aspects of fantasy. And when you come out of fantasy, you're not coming out of where your power is. The only place the ego doesn't like to live is right here, right now, what is real, what is true. And that's why it doesn't like it. But the conscious being, the one that sees their life as this heroic quest, doesn't care. I am what I am. I don't apologize. I don't have to make any excuses. I don't have to act to keep you happy. I am what I am. And come back in five years' time and I'll be more. But right now I am. And so as you look at that, you can see that you can simply and easily move into this assuredness of the present. When you look at the future, you can't fail to be nervous about it. You look at a world around you, it looks like things are disintegrating, there's a lack of control, there's wars going on, there's all this stuff going on. How can you think about the future and feel secure? It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Whereas if you're in the now, all you have to say to yourself is, am I secure right now? You say, yeah, I'm having a lovely time. This is great. Tonight we're having ice cream. I love it. Okay? And you're in the now. And so once you bring that back, you have that strength, you have that identity. An identity is vital. An identity is saying, I am eternal. I am immortal. I am infinite. All the stuff that's around me may not be as beautiful as I would like it, but I'm coming out of doing my best. You know, and everybody does, whether it's a guy that, that steals things or whatever they do, you know. I mean, everybody, even crooks, come out of doing the best they can. And they're sort of loving themselves because they're saying, if I can pinch all of this money, I'll be all right. I'll be better. I'll be a more loving human being. I can give some to my mates, you know. And I remember this little villain that I used to know in a pub back in England, and he was always trying to become a better villain, you know? Now, I wouldn't condone his actions, and I wouldn't see his actions as, as morally right, and I would consider his stealing people's property as an infringement upon them. But you could see this guy's sort of bright-eyed transcendence in his thievery. You know, and one day he came into the pub. One day he comes into the pub, and he's limping along. You know, and I said to him, I said, what's the matter? You know, I mean, what, what happened? He says, I fell off the roof. I said, well, what happened? He says, well, I was out burglarizing these houses and I fell off the roof and I should have known better, you know? I'm, I'm a better thief than a, the type that falls off the roof. He said, you know, I wasn't watching. It was dark. It was raining. And he says, you know, these new aluminum gutters that they have, they're just not up to the quality of the old ones, you know? They're just not up to the quality. The old cast iron ones were firm. You know, they just don't build houses like they used to. And I put my foot on this aluminum thing, and it fell, and I fell off the roof, and I had to limp home. And what kind of way is that to, to run a thieving career? You know, and I was saying to him, yeah, I can see how you could have a problem doing that. And again, I wasn't coming out of judging him or criticizing him, but you can see that every Everybody's trying hard, even if you don't understand how they're trying, you know, and that's important. And the same with yourself. You're doing the best you can, given the set of circumstances you have around you. As you begin to create that identity, then you see your life as this infinite transcendence. People say to you, like, it's a terrible day. You say, I think it's great that it's raining. I like rain. Ducks like rain. There's a whole group of people that love the stuff. You know, if people sort of say to you, well, the economy's falling apart, you say, well, I'm doing fine, you know. And if they say there's a lot of unemployment, you say, well, it's really interesting. My dad just got a job at like half the, um, at half the hours and double the wages. Doesn't matter if it's a lie. At least you're telling them you're feeling good, you know. It's like, I don't see the poverty. I don't see the difficulty. All I see is this incredible, ever-expanding beauty. The fact that some of people haven't got it yet, well, they'll get it in the end. And then what happens is, again, you're looking at the strong parts of the physical plane. The parts that make you laugh, the parts that make you happy, the parts that make you feel beautiful, the parts that make you feel cared for and loved. Those parts that have meaning. When you look at the media, when you look at the newspapers, whatever it is, they're constantly telling you about the mayhem. But the mayhem only represents a minute percentage of all that's out there. The fact is that they can't say to you, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, they're living in Cleveland, Ohio, and they've had a lovely day, and they love each other, and everything's fantastic. You know, tonight they're making love for the 19th time today. Their kids love them. The mortgage is paid. The car's running fine. You know, that's not news. But that's the truth for most people. 
You know, you would think by reading the media that everybody was dying violent deaths. A minute percentage of humanity dies a violent death. Most of them die old, in their beds, snoring, surrounded by their friends, and they say, well, I've had enough of this, I'm going to conk out, bye. And it's friendly and peaceful and loving, and angels show up for the event, it's great, you know? <laughs> so as you begin to move towards an identity that says infinity, that says beauty, that says strength, it becomes what you are. You may want to try this. Try for the next 30 days. You don't look at a television. You don't read a newspaper. You don't get any kind of information from what's going on around you. And suddenly you feel more peaceful. Suddenly people say, do you know that the government changed? You said, no, I didn't. You know, do you know that they, they closed all the banks? Oh, they did? That's really interesting. I didn't know that. You know, you can begin to create a feeling of like, this is my philosophy. I don't live in the mayhem. I live in a philosophy where I have this congruence. I have this identity. I have this power. And then as you begin to resonate this power, you're going to want to figure out what it is you want. Because most of the world doesn't know what they want. And what you want may change from today, and next month you want, may want something different, and the month after that you may want something different. But you have to be able to answer that question. If this supreme being sort of plopped down in your life and said to you, what do you want? What would you say? Uh, uh, mm, I don't know. You know, you got to know. If you put into the universal law, I haven't got a bloody clue, it reflects back to, we haven't got a bloody clue either. <laughs> you know? Forget it. You don't know. And you're driving. You know, you're the script writer. You're the director. If you don't know, we don't know. You see? And so, so many people put these incredibly wimpy feelings. And maybe what you want is, hey, I'd like to just be more organized. Okay, that's one thing you want. Let's work on that. Hey, I want to get out of this and do that. But you have to be clear about what it is you want. And if you're not clear about what it is you want, you move into what was discussed before, into a program of simplifying your life. Because if you're not in touch with that power inside of you that can feed you all the information that you're ever going to need, then you're a long way from the center of your being. And so if you are in that situation, you begin to toss things out. You know, you clean up. You have this kind of garage sale of your feelings and a garage sale of your possessions. And you get it all out there, and you clean it up, and you work with the associations. So you get down to this nut, this one person, this warrior. She's moving through the physical plane. She's strong. She's getting a clue about what she wants. She feels good about herself. She feels beautiful. She has a gift. He has a gift. He can move through. He's organized. He can serve the people because he knows what he wants. And as you begin to put into the universal law, I know what I want, it gives you back what you want. And it's a simple process. It's not, complica not complicated, but it's a matter of deciding. And there's none of you here that do not have the power to absolutely materialize everything that you ever want. And to materialize it and get actually more than you want. More abundance, more strength, more travel, communication, more interaction with humanity, more service to humanity. And that's important because otherwise, you're flapping. It's like the rudder's on the pier, and you're in the boat, and you're drifting. You know, and it's important. That is important. That, that what do you want reminds me of a little story that I'd like to share with you, which it takes place outside a brothel, but it's not a dirty story. There's this couple of kids, okay, and it's the best what do you want story that I've ever heard. There are these two kids playing in the sand outside a brothel in New Jersey. And the customers come past these two little kids, and they come up the stairs, and they knock on the door, the customers. And the madame, who's this very, very large lady, comes to the door and she says to the customers, what do you want? And the customer goes, you know what I want. And she says to him, you got any money? And he says, I've got $20. She says, come in. So the customer goes into the, into the brothel and the kids are watching this. And then another guy comes along and he's up the stairs, he's knocking on the door. There's this huge lady, this, this sort of Genghis Khan of the brothel industry. And she's standing there and she's saying, what do you want? And the guy says, you know what I want. She says, well, you got any money? And the fellow says, yeah, I've got $20. She says, all right, come in. So the kids are looking among each other and thinking, God, oh, this is really interesting. I wonder what this could be. So they look in their pockets and they're figuring out how much money they got and they come up with 50 cents. So they decide to try it. So they go up the stairs of this brothel, brothel and knock on the bottom of the door because they weren't real tall. And she opens the door and she goes, what do you want? And the kids are there and they go, you know what we want. <laughs> and as they say that, they begin to walk in the brothel. And she sees the 50 cents in their hands and she grabs their hair and she bangs their heads together, bong. And she throws them down the stairs and out of the brothel into the dirt again. And so they're down there and they're totally dazed and they can't figure out what the heck's going on and they're dusting each other down and one says to the other, if that's 50 cents, I don't think I could take $20. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Okay, the final part of this is that as you've decided what you want, you're resonating this intention for your life, you have to begin to have all of the aspects of your life in control. Not because there's anything up there going, na 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 if it isn't in control, but basically speaking, if your life is not in control, you're beginning to resonate feelings that say, I am insecure, I don't know what's happening. This situation is controlling me, I'm not controlling it. And so you have to go back into your life and lovingly look at, hey, do I control this situation? And of course, sometimes you're going to be happy to abdicate control. You know, you'll get into, into a car with somebody and you'll abdicate control of that situation and you'll let them drive because you feel good about them. But at any one given moment of your life, you want to ask that question, do I control this situation? Am I imposing my consciousness, my feelings, my transcendence into this and creating a destiny that is my destiny? And as you develop that control, and it takes time, it takes habit, because everything is designed to take the control away from you. Everything is designed to take your power away from you. Nobody out there gives a damn how you're doing. They don't care. They are running their institutions for them. They're not running them for you at all. You know, if you think that they are, forget it. They're not. So as you begin to take the control back, you can exercise control on, in your life without infringing upon other people. And you constantly pull back. If there's danger, you pull back. If there's a tremendously emotional situation, you pull back. If there's some difficulty over here, you fix it or you pull back. And so as you begin to establish an overall pattern of control, then all of a sudden, all of those things that you ever want will become a part of your life.